welcome friends, family, and visitors to Spindale United Methodist Church. We are glad that you are here. Happy Father's Day. Please note the upcoming deadline for the Mitchell Scholarship is this Tuesday, June 21st, 2022. Contact the church office if you need more information. There will be an upcoming staff parish meeting this Wednesday, June the 22nd at 6 p.m. in the parlor. The next Frankful Friday will be this Friday, June the 24th. Pastor Eric and volunteers will be set up under the tree next to the blessing box at 12 noon. And a rem couple reminders about next Sunday, June the 26th. There will be an ad council meeting immediately following the worship service next Sunday. Also, check Friday's e-news for details regarding an open garden at Nancy Womack's home. Please check your newsletter or weekly e-news for a full list of announcements. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Lord, we come to you with grateful hearts for the many blessings of today, this past week, and across time that you have given us. Thank you for your love during all of our grief and disappointments, as well as our joys and accomplishments. Thank you for being with us when we are sick or when we are worried. Help us to likewise be with those who mourn and those who rejoice and to comfort those who are sick and in prison. Open our hearts and help us listen to the message this morning. Be with us as we go back into the world refreshed and carrying your word to share. Amen.
y'all doing today? Front row's doing pretty well. Anyone else doing all right? In the back, there you go, Lynn. Thank you for participating this morning. I want to <laughs> I'm in a good mood for some reason today. Maybe because it's Father's Day. That could be. Or maybe we're talking about love again. That could be as well. I always talk, enjoy talking about love. And, and during this series, I think it's, uh, did anyone go back as a homework assignment and watch Love on the Spectrum? Did it, was anyone influenced? Well, wow, well, you're listening to me. That's incredible. Isn't it wonderful? I, I love how that uh, the, the people are in this show um, is just so pure and unfiltered and it's without motives or prerequisites in how they view love. And I think that is a very appropriate way or a, a very appropriate way of describing a father's love in most cases. How would you like that tie-in? Did you get that? Thank, Lynn, give me the thumbs up. Yeah, that's what we're going to talk about today. That's probably no surprise. And I was kind of thinking about this as I was putting this sermon together, kind of praying for inspiration. And God made it very clear to me to, that I should talk about a certain parable called the parable of the lost son, a parable, par, parable of the prodigal son. Maybe a little bit of a twist, perhaps, from the way you've heard it before. But I think that's the direction we, we should be going today, and that's the direction we will be going. And we're going to kind of bounce off this one meme that we have. I can't get rid of memes. This is not the memeing of life still, but we love memes in here, and we'll do this. This is based on a quote that my dad used to say all the time. If we could pop that up here. Uh, there we go. That's my dad fishing at our favorite place on Bear Creek, uh, down on the coast there. And the quote says, if you want to have a happy, fulfilled life, then love God, love yourself, love others, and the rest will work itself out. <laughs> I love, love, love that quote. We talked about it in some great detail this morning at Bible study, how we lean into every situation with love, and I think that is uh, right on point with who God is. And I can't think of a better story than the lost son to tell the, the, the love of a father. And if you know the story, I'm not going to read the entire thing. It's long. You should read it. It's a wonderful passage. We're going to read a little bit of it in just a minute. But what, what we have is a, a young man who is looking into the world saying there must be something better out there, right? Has any, anyone has ever, ever done that? Like where you are right now, I know there's something better out there. So he not only thinks about it, he acts upon it. And then he asks his dad for his inheritance, which was, whoo, he didn't do that. But he got that, his dad gave it to him. He went out to Vegas or wherever he went, spent all his money uh, and fast living and all that. And then he realizes, hey, I blew it. Oh my gosh. It's kind of like, very much like the Wizard of Oz, right? Dorothy goes out in this big fantasy world, even though it's a dream. But then she realizes the entire time, if she clicks her heels together, what happened? I'm right where I want to be. I'm right back at home. So anyway, there you go. That's a very strange way of setting up the law of sun, but there you go. Hope you're with me. You guys okay? I told you I'm in a good mood this morning. There's no telling what could be said. This is Luke chapter 15, verses 20 through 24. Love this, love this, so much. But while he was still a long way off, we're talking about the son here, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger, his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, but is now alive again. He was lost, but is now found. So now they begin to celebrate. Now that's one side of the story. That's one we hear about a lot, the father meeting the prodigal son of the lost son. But let's look at the other son here for a minute, see what happens. This is verses 25 through 30. It says, meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed a fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes 
comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. Now with that said, here's my question for you this morning. Which son is the lost son? Anyone? Maybe both sons are the lost son. I mean, even though we typically assume that the son who took the money and ran was a lost one, what about the son who stayed and became bitter from that experience? You see, what we have here are two brothers who each represent a different kind of lostness, if you will. And honestly, for them and for the rest of us, really being lost is a terrible feeling. Has anyone ever been lost before? Raise your hand. Partic participate with me this morning. We've all been lost in some capacity. I was in Ingalls the other day, primarily because that's my wife's favorite grocery store. But I was there by myself. I, it just became a habit. I was like, I'm going to Ingalls. So I did. I went to Ingalls. I walked in there. And the first thing I see, because I see odd things all the time, and I'm in situations that probably no one else finds himself in, but I'm standing there. I walk in, and I hear a baby crying. Okay, well, that's not unusual. We hear baby crying, babies crying all the time. But I hear a, a young child, really is what it is, crying. And I look, and I see the child, and there was no parent, no parental units of any kind around them, no adults. And it was just crying, lips were rolled back. <laughs> there was a full body cry. And I was like, wow, well, that's a baby. And I'm looking around, and I walk up to the baby, and the baby was just so, so upset and so alone. And I stood there, and I was like, well, there's got to be a parent around, to when a parent did walk up, and she looked at me like I was Satan, like I caused the baby to cry. And I was like, I didn't do that. I, you know, I'm <laughs> and then I, wa I walk away. But a lot, of, a lot of time, I mean, that's the situation I find myself in quite often. But the thing is, when we're lost, we're very much like this child. We're looking around. We've lost our bearings. We're very upset by the experience of not knowing where we are and where that safety net of home may be. So, yeah, let's call it what it is. Being lost in any shape, form, or fashion is really no fun at all. And honestly, if you think about it, we've all been there at some point in our lives, right? For example, maybe it's a, a financial thing where no matter how hard you try, you just can't get those ends to meet. It just wasn't work. You're still behind. Or maybe it's existentially, where you might question who you are, what you've done, or where you're going, kind of what this is all about. Or it could be relationally, where perhaps you were in a great relationship. Everything was hunky-dory. Maybe you had children together, and then boom, something happens. It goes south, and you can't find your bearings now, perhaps because of that. It could even be spiritually, where perhaps you feel like you're doing all the right things, you're praying, you're going to church, you're serving, you're studying, you're laughing at Pastor Eric's jokes, all those things, but no matter how hard you try, you still, you still feel like you're alienated from God. So yeah, this is a story of a father who had two sons, both of which were lost in their own way. Now, thankfully for us, we serve a God whose primary concern is finding the lost, right? In fact, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. He said, for the Son of Man, Jesus, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And so, if being lost on occasion is a common characteristic of being human, well then what is it that we can learn from the experience? Or in other words, like my dad said, kind of based on his quote, how will things all work out at the end? Well, here's the first thing. When we're lost, the first thing we may learn, at least eventually, is that most often we don't know that we're lost, right? Have you ever thought about that? When you're lost, you typically have no idea that you're lost, right? You see, when we're, we're in that mode, when we are lost, we tend to make poor decisions. And when we make poor choices or decisions, it's very easy for us to get caught up in the moment, in the circumstances, and end up in a place where we really don't want to be. For example, in our scripture reading today, we find where the younger man, again, was seeking the greener grass on the other side. And so he boldly asked his dad for his inheritance. Now, why is that significant? Well, it's significant because to gather your inheritance, usually what has to happen? Someone has to die, right? And so essentially he's looking at his, his dad right in the eyes and saying, I wish you were dead. I wish you were taking a dirt nap. And you see, the reason this is true is because obviously in most situations, inheritance was something that was given primarily in that time to the older 
the older sibling, and then they would disperse going down. But the younger guy stepped in and said, I want mine now, which also included some of the older brothers, right? So the older brother would have been upset as well. So you see, the younger son was lost in a major way, and he didn't even know it. And that's because when someone is lost, they're typically not thinking very clearly. Now, in those moments where perhaps we become lost, a good safety check for all of us is kind of based on something the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. And this is what he said. He said, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then who are mature should take a, such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, God will make it clear to you. You see, if you're lost and scrambling and feel disconnected from God in some way, well, then the natural progression that comes from this posture is that we become vulnerable to making some incredibly horrific decisions that can not only derail our own lives, but it can also hurt those people whom we love, those people in the periphery, right? So, yes, yeah, sometimes, maybe oftentimes, when we're lost, we don't even know it. So in all things, at all times, we should make an uncompromising effort to stay connected to, to the Father through prayer and study and counsel and conversations with other people in a posture of awareness, self-awareness, I should say, and also humility. Now, a second thing, and you guys, again, look so serious this morning. Are you really getting into what I'm saying? Or you wish I'd stop talking. Which one is it? I'm just curious. That was just a little sidebar. Now you're back with me. Okay. A second thing that is so important to know when you're lost is that no matter how far you've strayed, no matter how lost you might be, check this out. You are still loved. You are still loved. For example, when the father sees his son coming, what was his reaction? I mean, did he throw rocks at him, or did he smite him, or did he taunt him? Did he turn his back on him, or call him bad names? No, no, no. What did the father do? He put on his sneakers and he ran towards his son, right? And then on top of that, check this out. This is so cool. The father hugged him and kissed him and put some bling on him and fired up the grill and hired a DJ and, and had a party that Cool in the Gang would eventually write a song about. If you know, you know, right? Celebrate. Anyway, in other words... The only thing on this father's mind was that his son was home, that he loved his son and he was back. He missed him and he was there. I mean, it's kind of like this. If you hadn't noticed this about me, I know Jean has because she called me on this a couple times, but I'm a rebellious spirit, right? Jean said, Eric, you're a rebellious spirit. That's what I see standing in front of me. But I am. I've always been that way. I'm the guy, you remember the story, I burned the hole in my mom's car seat. I'm also the guy who hid beer in my closet. I thought that would be a good idea. I'm the one who, during a baseball game I was pitching, I didn't like the, the, the calls the ump was making. I threw my glove down and yelled out an expletive. I was like 12, okay? And all this started really when I was in first grade, and, and this was a moment that I hear about quite often from the family, but I was a talker. I don't, know if, I don't know where that came from, but I was a talker when I was in first grade. And if you're a teacher, I'm the person you're like, oh, I just wish they'd go away. I just stop, just quit, whatever. And so I was the one, and I kept talking and talking and talking. My first grade teacher, her, whose name was Miss Fells, and I loved her. I think I loved her more than it was reciprocated, but I, I, I loved her. She was a great teacher. But I talked all the time, apparently, and so much so that she would pin little notes to my shirt. Did, you, did any of you ever get that? Was that just me? I feel so lonely in here sometimes. <laughs> but they, she did. She, she'd write a little note saying, Eric is talking too much in class. And she'd pin the note to, my, to make sure my parents saw it. And I didn't know this. I didn't know this, but my dad was collecting them over the years of how many. He still has them today. Matter of fact, they, they ran into, my parents ran into Miss Fells in like the drugstore one day or whatever, and they saw her on the drug aisle, you know, where they have all the painkillers. And, and they said, well, how is Eric doing now? And, and she said, well, um, Eric is still talking as much or maybe more, and that's why I'm here. I'm getting some aspirin because he just, he's wearing me out, okay? So yeah, yeah, I mean, even in this, my dad, who collected all these notes, he was in some way proud of me. 
I don't know why, but he would look at me and say, that's my boy. That's my son. Yeah, I know he talks a little bit too much, and he's a little strange. He's a little offbeat. Okay, we'll, just, we'll put it that way, a nice way. But he's my boy. He's my son. You see, this father loved his son so much that when he saw him coming, he dropped everything, his dignity, his need to be right, his pride, and he stopped his son in mid-apology and showed him that his love for him was not based on words or actions, but rather it was based solely on the fact that this is my boy, this is my son, right? You see, it's important to know that when you are lost, you are still loved. And that's uh, really, in a nutshell, that's a father's love for their child. It is unique. It is generous. It's non-negotiable. And it's, uh, it's a tie that is not easily unraveled, torn, or diminished. Matter of fact, it's kind of like this other meme. Again, I, I'm sorry, but I love memes. It's kind of like this other one. Uh, from Steve, I think, can you pop that one up here? I think it's from Steve Martin. I love what it says here. It says, a father carries pictures where his money used to be. You think about that, dads. I think about all the times that my dad would motor me down the road to a baseball practice or baseball camp or whatever it may have been. I mean, spending money upon money. I mean, if, if the gas prices back then were like they are now, then I can't imagine, but I'm sure even then they weren't great. Actually, they weren't great because that was during the Jimmy Carter years. I think they were pretty high then. Not to pick on Jimmy Carter, that's not what the sermon's about. But ha high gas prices. I digress. Anyway, I think about the money that my dad must have spent. And what does he have in his wallet in place of that? My notes from first grade. He had baseball clippings from when I was in the paper, when I, when I was playing baseball. He probably didn't have very much cash. He had those things because that's what was important to my dad. Matter of fact, I didn't know this, and my dad was always very supportive of me playing sports or whatever I was doing, but I didn't realize uh, how highly he thought of me athletically. You know, he tells my, my son, his grandchildren now, what a wonderful baseball player I was. You know, he's, he was great. I'm like, wow, I've just become better over time, I guess. I don't know if that's the case or not, but he was that proud. Matter of fact, and I may have said this earlier, but he still have all, has all those things. He still has his notes from first grade. He still has my baseball clippings, even today. And so you see, the first son we have here was obviously lost. I mean, that, it, it's a given. And when he got home, what he found was not hate or contempt or smiting. He found acceptance and he found love. But when the older son, the, the other lost son, really saw this, what was his reaction to all of that? Well, it was contempt. It was, he was bitter, he was angry, and he was even jealous. You see, the older brother is often overlooked in the story because, remember, he was the one who always followed the rules. Boom, boom, boom. He did everything that he was supposed to do. I mean, if you think about it, I'm sure after the younger brother shoved off, the older brother kind of had to stand in the gap, and he had to bail all the hay or, you know, I don't know, plow the back 40, milk the yaks. I don't know what he had to do, but he had to fill in the gaps for his brother, what, what his brother wasn't, couldn't do while he was there. And so with all that said, and if all that is true, meaning that the older brother did do all the things he was supposed to do, then why in the wide world of sports was he lost? Why would you think that's, that's true? Well, it's kind of like this. And before I tell this story, I'm certainly not pointing a light on me like I'm a hero, because if you listen to the whole story, you'll find out that I'm not. But I was in Walmart the other day, and I'm not talking about Walmart this morning. I just happened to be in Walmart, and it was actually a wonderful time in Walmart. No one bumped into me. No one called me a name. I went through the checkout line quickly. It was a good experience. And you remember last week, I was feeling pretty good. I was like, okay, well, we did Love Is Part 1. We had a good reaction, wonderful conversations after that sermon, etc. So I left on a spiritual high. And so I go into Walmart. I have a good experience there. I walk out with a couple of bags, and then I'm greeted by two women who say, sir, can you help me? And I was thinking immediately, guys, you know what I'm talking about here, she wants me to change her tire. And that's exactly what she wanted me to do. Because she didn't know how to do it. She didn't know where her spare tire was, she didn't know where the tools were, she didn't know, you know all those things. And I'm going, oh my, and it's inside. Internally, I'm going, oh my gosh, oh. Inside, I'm going, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll help you, whatever. What do you need me to do? 
And so there was this duality between how I reacted to it. I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Inside, I'm like, gosh, I wish I could be, I can't believe I'm doing this. And you go down, you know, when you're changing the tires, that lug nut, getting the lug nuts off, that's the hard part, really. The rest of it's kind of cream cheese. But you're getting that, and I'm sweating, I grease up to my elbows, I'm like, ah, and I'm still smiling at her. Yes, ma'am, no problem. You make yourself comfortable. And inside, I'm just hating this situation. And I finally get it, and I'm done, and I'm sweaty, and I'm hot, and I'm greasy, and all that, and tires change. And this lady walks around to the side she said sir I've been watching you from one over there and I want to tell you how impressed I am that men still do that and will still help and they'll 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 love their neighbor like that and of course I went inside I was like down like this oh gosh you I'm glad you can't read me internally because I wasn't saying all that but you know what it was the right thing to do right it was the right thing to do in that situation but that is how the older son really is looking at a situation where there would be a blessing if he looked at it differently, right? And he's looking at this through a skewed lens of, I don't really want to forgive him. I don't want to accept my brother because he did this. And he made it inconvenient for me. I've had a good day until now. Now I see him running across the field, and now you've just ruined everything in my day. You see, the older brother found himself in a place where he was so bitter that there was not, not only no room in his heart to be happy to see his brother again, but there also was no room left in his heart to forgive him either. And forgiveness is difficult, isn't it? I mean, it's very much like I've said in here before, being bitter doesn't make you better. It just makes you better at being bitter, right? And so you see, when we're unaccepting of people who are different than we are, or who may interfere with our plans, or have a different lifestyle, than what we do all together, then in truth, it's a short walk to becoming a bitter, unforgiving, apathetic, unaccepting person. I mean, one of the most amazing things about our Savior Jesus is that Jesus, like any good father, always puts family first, right? But Jesus looks at it a little differently sometimes because Jesus' family is large. The table is crowded. This is all your family, what Jesus is saying. But this is what he says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. He says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called children of God. Right? Say that with me. Say children of God. Children of God, children of God we are. Right? We are children of God. You see, the tragedy that comes with life off so often is that there are so many people who just don't know the bandwidth of God's love for them. I mean, they just don't. You see, when we're lost, like this older brother, we can become grizzled and salty and unaccepting because since we've done all the work and checked all the boxes, well, then for some reason, we think this world in some way owes us something. But friends, it's just like something else my dad said. My dad was a very wise, he still is a very wise man. I don't mean to diminish that. But it's something else he used to say to me, and I think I said it in here before, but he said, Eric... This world does not owe you a thing. This world does not owe you a thing. And that's very true, I would say. See, the problem with the older son wasn't that he was bad or that he was greedy, greedy or lazy or just a jerk, but rather it was that he was expectant. In other words, based on his actions, he was expecting to get what he thought he deserved. You see, if you're a person of faith, sometimes based on poor teaching or misinterpretation of scripture, you may also be led to believe that because of the wonderful, wonderful things that you might do, that now God is somehow indebted to you, that God owes you something. Well, you see, here's the deal. First of all, that's wrong. <laughs> that's absolutely the opposite of being right. But if you live your life of faith based on the paradigm that says, if I serve and obey God, then I will get exactly what I, I want the most. Well, let me just say this. Start holding your breath right now. Do that. Start holding your breath right now, because that's just not going to work. You see, that is not the way God rolls. And I also say this on top of it. God doesn't owe us anything, because God has already given us everything in Jesus Christ. That was worthy of at least one amen. I got a head nod right there. God has given us everything. You see, we can be rebellious and lost, 
or we can be religious and lost. In fact, this is exactly what the older brother forgot, that everything we receive from God is a gift of grace, not based on our performance, but based on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so, friends, like these two sons, it's important to remember that, first, if you're lost, sometimes you don't even know it. So listen to counsel. You know, right? be, be receptive to, to words from pe- trusted people of the faith that maybe help you, can help you discover that maybe you're going down the wrong path. And second, if you're lost, it's equally important to know that you are still loved. You are loved. You really are. And so, yeah, the profound words of my dad really do ring true when he said, love God, love yourself, love others, and the rest will kind of work itself out. You see, it's really amazing that when we approach life with faith, grace, forgiveness, and love, just like our dad in heaven, and hopefully just like your dad's on earth, that life does tend to to work out. Even though there there will be struggles, that love always finds a way. I could say so much more about my dad. We could go on and on, and as I'm sure you have stories about yours. I just want to tell one story about my dad now to give you a snapshot of him. It may have nothing to do with anything else except for Father's Day. But I want to say this, and it's kind of weird, so don't judge me any more than you are now. Uh, but my, my dad, I grew up in a family where fishing and hunting were a big part of who we were. We, 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 did, we went fishing and hunting, and, and um, my dad took me, this, it was kind of, kind of a family thing, I don't know, on, on Thanksgiving we would go squirrel hunting. I don't know why, we, we just did, we went squirrel hunting. There have been a lot of a lot of squirrels to kill around here, I guess. And if you're a pet lover, I'm sorry right now. You probably don't like squirrels even if you are a pet lover. But So we went, we went squirrel hunting, and I was knee-high to it. I mean, I could barely. It was my grandfather's double-barrel shotgun. I could barely hold the thing up. But I had this, and I looked like you know, Elmer Fudd with my little hunting hat on. And I don't know how to hold the gun. I'm, if you know who Elmer Fudd is, get that image in your mind. As so I'm out there, and, and my dad, you know, he, and I, I didn't see well back then either. But my dad said, there he is. There he is. And, we're, and it's a really, if you're hunting, it's kind of a wild situation because you don't feel like you can step on a twig or a leaf. You, you don't want to scare the game away. So I was like very careful. And I hold up, hold up this big gun that was bigger than I was, and I shot. Boom! And I was proud that I shot, that he worked and all that. And I was like, wow. And, and then my dad took off running. He ran. And I didn't know why. I didn't know if I did something wrong, if I'm going back to tell mom that I missed, or why. I don't know what he was doing. But he ran. He ran through the woods, down this little hill, back up the other side to where the tree was that the squirrel that I shot at was. And all I see is my dad turn around and his shot and gun, <laughs> shot and gun, and he went boom. And then he held up a squirrel and said, "You got him." Now that may not mean a thing to you, but that meant a lot to me because my dad wanted me to have that kill. My dad wanted me to have that victory. I didn't shoot that squirrel. I guess I, I may have grazed him or something and he was down on the ground and dad finished him off that's what your dad will do for you your dad will stand in the gap the dad will, your dad will celebrate when you win that 10th place trophy right we make fun of that sometimes but a father's love is there I learned how to play baseball I learned how to fish I learned a lot of things about being a father from my dad was my dad perfect or is he perfect no but he was perfect for me I love him I hope all today as you're celebrating your own fathers or your husbands, the fathers in your life, I hope you understand that. It's not easy being a dad sometimes. It really isn't. Uh, we mess up quite often, but we, we do love the opportunity to try. I want to make a, sh- a sharp turn away from that quickly. and We are concluding. Don't worry. I'm not going into anything major uh, lengthwise anyway, but I think I would be remiss if I also didn't mention what today is. This is also the day uh, that's called Juneteenth. And we celebrate that because that's where full emancipation of all all people came into being. I think it was 1865, a couple years after uh, Lincoln made his statement. And so with that said, uh, as I often am, I'm I'm moved by poetry. And I wanted to read a poem. I I promise if you're worried, this is going to end soon. I'm I'm going to read this poem and we'll we'll conclude. But this is by um, Maya Angelou. And she wrote a poem called Still I Rise. Still I Rise. We'll conclude with this, and I'll go immediately into a prayer afterwards. This is what she writes. She says, you may write me down in history 
with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides, just like hopes springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness. But still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide. Welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise. I rise. I rise. Will you pray with me? Most Heavenly Father, um, as we come together, together today in celebrating our, our fathers, our dads, we just want to thank you so much for giving us the best example of what a dad is supposed to be. And I think this is obviously no coincidence in Father's Day and Juneteenth being together this year on this Sunday because I think there's a lot of comparisons to understanding, fi finally getting our stride, finally get, getting some clarity on what love actually is and making some you know, becoming more accepting, I should say, and loving all people unconditionally. And Lord, I, we're not there yet. We're not finished. There's still, you know, contempt and racism in this world today. But Lord, I pray that, that we do make some more strides, that we get this right, that we no longer look at someone and identify them by their, their skin color. And I think, really, again, as we celebrate our dads today, that it, it, this is an important time for us as fathers, as men, to step up and not be quiet, but to fight for those. Fight for those who can't fight for themselves. Because it's a great day when we do something good for someone who could never repay us. And I pray that, that those are the kind of hearts that we have. And understanding, yeah, we've made great strides, but we still have a ways to go. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. A couple, uh, couple reminders for this week. We have all kinds of meetings coming up. SPRC on Wednesday, Admin Council next Sunday. Uh, did I miss any other meetings that were in there? No one? Anyone want to add a meeting? I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> we have a couple coming up. Um, this Friday is also a wonderful time. Uh, we're having Frankful Fridays again. 
It'll be a, uh, just, just we, we have such a wonderful experience coming together and meeting our community through this mission. So please join us for that if you haven't before. If you want uh, to help out in any way monetarily or through donations, uh, we, we, we always need stuff for that. So uh, please contact me or uh, anyone on the crew. We had a successful community meal this, this past week too. Carolyn steered that, didn't you? You did. I was there. I saw it. I seen it. It was good. So it, it's a wonderful time. It's a wonderful time in this church, really. I believe that. You're wonderful people. Thank you for having hearts for this community. Thank you for loving each other. Let's just keep it going. Let's keep raising that bar. Let's say a closing prayer. Unless anyone wants house, any, any other announcements? No? Y'all look terrified right now. Let's pray. Most Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together in corporate worship. I pray that as we say every week that we understand church starts now. There's so much to do in this world that uh, we're going to have situations where we have to change tires. We're going to have situations where we have to stand in the gap for someone else. We're going to have situations where we have to make the hard decision to love first. And Lord, I, I, I honestly believe that comes from you. I believe we find ourselves in those situations because it is a situation where we, we can make a choice. We can love or we can go the other way. And I think when we love, we do the right thing, then you show up in a, in a wonderful way and say, yep, that's my boy or that's my girl. So I pray we get that. I pray that we step into every situation that you put in front of us in such a way. For us in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. God bless you and happy Father's Day.